Authorities, bundle one, tab. Tab four. Bundle. Tab four. Should have article 132. Yep. And we can see member states shall exempt the following transactions B, hospital and medical care and closely related activities undertaken by bodies governed by public law, etc. And then C, the provision of medical care and the exercise of the medical and paramedical professions as defined by the member state concerned. You may have seen in the upper tribunal decision. Um, they made a point of saying we rely only on C rather than B, and that's correct as a matter of EU law, because we are not a body governed by public law. So you don't fall into B, you accept you don't fall into exactly. B because you're not governed by public law. Exactly. Yep. The domestic law exemptions are our behind tab 3 on page 10. This is Schedule 9 of the VAT Act 1994, Group 7. In 1, I hope you can see item 1, sorry, the supply of services consisting in the provision of medical care by a registered person who enrolled in any of the following A, the register of medical care. And then if you look down to item four on the same page, the provision of med uh, care or medical provision of care or medical or surgical treatment and in connection with it, the supply of any goods in any hospital or state regulated institution. Point to note there is it says in any hospital rather than by. Sorry, which box are we looking at? I'm just trying um, to... Oh, item four, my lord, down the left-hand column. So you yes. say you come within both item one and item four? We can fall within either, my lord. And, and can you... 
Excuse my ignorance. What is the relationship between the domestic exemptions and the EU exemptions? And does it matter that we've now left the EU? My Lord, um, this would still be retained EU law, so it would still fall to be interpreted under ordinary principles. But if I could just show you um, tab 39, please. Which is an extract from HMRC VAT manuals, which refers precisely to this tension between UK and EU law in versus bar. Sorry, the significance, this is the in and by. This is the in and by point. I mean, the, the next point I was about to make is I don't think this troubles this court because my, my learned friend, I understand, has, has confirmed that HMRC are not taking any point on the location where these services are provided, which um, might have appeared from his skeleton argument. Obviously, he'll be able to confirm that himself. But um, on, on that basis, the only question for this court is really are these supplies of medical care? In which case you don't need to worry about which limb of the domestic law exemptions could apply or whether both of them could apply. And as a matter of EU law, as I said, it's only C that we say we do fall within. So there was a, a substantive policy change when it went from being pure EU, e EU law to EU retained law. And this was presumably Section 8 of the 2018 Act, the Brexitization process. They changed by to in, presumably. In no, order no, my Lord, this, this predates. Predates um, Brexit. This has been there. Um, right. It, it sounds to me from what you just said as if we don't need to concern ourselves because if it's medical care, it, you say it falls within item one and you don't need to item four. And if it's not medical care, you don't come within either. Ex exactly, my lord. So, really, I, I, I draw this to your attention because. Academically interesting but irrelevant. Academically interesting but irrelevant. So, so we shall t take, we, for our purposes, we make the assumption that the EU retained version is intended to be consistent with the directive. And my Lord, but the years under consideration fall before Brexit anyway, so you'd be applying yeah. okay. pre-Brexit. Right. And under under pre-Brexit rules, the mild leasing obligation would require you to construe the domestic legislation in conformity with the EU directive, and we can't have a wider exemption than permitted by EU law, is that not right? My, my Lord, that's, I, I would say it's broadly correct, it raises a lot of interesting points, you've seen HMRC specifically say that's not an interpretation that they, 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 they adopt, but given that it's academically interesting but yes. irrelevant to this case, perhaps but, I'd be better. Because it's pre-EU departure, well of course we're, we're beyond the implementation date now, for present purposes, we're assuming, are we, without getting into interesting academic footnotes, that the two are the same? Or does your argument... My argument it? doesn't depend on any difference. I was showing you a point that arose out of what the upper tribunal said, because the upper tribunal criticised the FTP for saying you, it, you can fall within either of the domestic provisions. Um, but it doesn't matter, because my learner friend has confirmed that they don't take any points on the location where the services were provided. If that was being pursued, then this could be relevant. Okay, well, let's see where we get to rather than try and work it out in advance. Exactly. That's exactly my point. So, in light of those legislative provisions, the issue in this case, we say, is whether the supply of main, by main pay of the medical services of a doctor fall within those exemptions for medical care. In the first tier tribunal, in the upper tribunal, as you'll have seen, the case was argued on the basis that there would be a supply of medical care unless there was a supply of staff. So these were sort of set up as alternatives. And then a lot of attention was devoted to, to working out the limits um, and meaning of supply of staff and various concepts that are under that. But in 
this case, as I understand it, HMRC say that's wrong. They say <coughs> there's no such concept as a supply of staff. The legislative phrase is provision of medical care. They just say, don't they, that I mean, it's just the orthodoxy that all supplies are taxable unless you can show they're within exemption. So the critical question for us is whether these supplies come within the medical exemption. And if they don't, it doesn't matter very much what you call them. Uh, I agree. I agree. And that's uh, right. I mean, that is, my doctrinally, that is right. That, that's it? absolutely right. And so we may have spent too much attention um, in the court, the tribunals below, on, on, on the phrase of the arm, the sort of key phrase, um, or even a legislative phrase, because I agree. Yes, the, the, the key test is, is this medical care? Um, and my learner friend's argument is that there's no provision of medical care where the supply was procured by another in order to facilitate their own supply of medical care. In this case, they say supplies by main pay of these medical services of doctors were procured by the NHS Trust in order to facilitate the supply of medical care by the NHS Trust. And the only person in that scenario who's making a supply of medical care is the NHS Trust. So, as my lady um, foreshadowed, I, I agree with HMRC. The statutory phrase is whether this is medical care, and there's no reference to a concept of supply of staff. And equally, the cases also look at the question positively in terms of is this medical care? And therefore, I'll adopt the same approach. My argument, then, in light of, of the way the case is now, um, set up is that whilst it's correct that main pay supply of medical services of its doctors are procured in order to facilitate the supply of medical care by the NHS, as a matter of law, supplies which are procured in order to facilitate supply of medical care by another are, or at least can be, medical care themselves if they satisfy the relevant conditions in terms of being provided by a person with the relevant qualifications. Ultimately, the question set up for this court, as I um, submit it should be understood, is, well, if a person, if the supply is made in order to facilitate supply of medical care by another, <coughs> does that stop it being exempt? I mean, it's not medical care in its own right and therefore not exempt. And that's ultimately a question of law, we say. So the logic of your argument would be that even if we were to conclude that it was supply of staff, it doesn't preclude it also being a supply of medical care. Well, the, the argument sort of moved on from that, that issue. My learned friend says, well, let's not, we shouldn't be wasting any time on what a supply of staff is, because ultimately the question... Yeah, and I'm just looking at the judgments below. Yes. Well, the, the, it's, that would be the logic of your case. But that's a wrong categorization. You simply ask yourself, is it a supply of medical care? If it is, how it's supplied and what directly and indirectly procured or immediately provided is irrelevant. Yes, and I'll take you through the, the steps of that in the case law. But ultimately, yes, if it's medical care, it's exempt, which is simply the statutory language. And it, it's important in my submission to understand the scope of the argument because below, it was always uh, a bit of a puzzle to me at least, and I may have been alone in this, but to understand how it could be the case that, uh, well, on what basis HMRC said the supplies of a self-employed local doctor going directly to the NHS, do exactly the same sort of thing main pay doctors would do, um, could be outside the exemption. But now it, it's, it's quite clear, to be fair to my little friend, the argument has now formulated is that if your supply is made to facilitate the supply of medical care by another, your own supply is not itself medical care. And so that argument applies with full force to the self-employed locum going directly to the NHS. On HMRC's case, that's a taxable supply. It's not medical care. Equally applies to the self-employed locum, sorry, the, the, the locum who sets up a personal service company and provides their services through the personal service company to the NHS, that is not a supply that's exempt. 
And equally, of course, my learned friend says, our supplies are not exempt because we are simply another form of the intermediary between the doctor and the NHS. But in all those cases, whether you go directly or through an intermediary, because you're facilitating the supply of medical care by another, you're not exempt. That's how I understand the argument as now formed. And so it is an argument with significant uh, and wide consequences. It means that any self-employed locum going directly to the NHS to um, provide medical care on a particular hospital is not making an exempt supply. And, and we say it, it must be right that each of those supplies, the direct supply or the intermediated supply through the intermediary, have the same VAT treatment because at the end of the day, what is provided is the same. And it's important to bear in mind we are characterizing the supply here. We're not characterizing main pays business. That's a, a red herring. We're characterizing the supply. What does the what does the recipient get? What is provided? Aren't we characterizing the supply between main pay and A and E? Isn't that the supply that we're looking at? Yes, my lady. What does, it, what does main pay supply to A and E? Yes, my lady, but it's back to back and onto the NHS. Yes, so, so you say, but I mean that's that's where the VAT has been targeted, isn't it? It's on that supply. Yes, so we, we provide what we provide to A and E is then directly in the same exactly the same form on the supply to the NHS. Yes. So what we are offering, I mean what we are offering are the medical services of a doctor. And whether it's the person who wants that supply is A&E so that they can then supply it to the NHS, or whether the person that wants that is the NHS directly, what is being provided is exactly the same in both cases. And equally... Well, I understand that's your case. You say medical services go up to main pay, they go across to A&E, they go from A&E to the NHS Trust, and then the NHS Trust yes. uses them to make supplies to its own clients, to its own... Patients, I should say, not clients. Yes, I mean, technically the NHS doesn't make supplies because it's not charging, but... Provides, a, what does it, provide health care? Provide health care, yes. Uh, but, but yes, my lady, when you have that chain of supply, we say that it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. And because what's being provided, what's being offered, is the same. And it's the same, equally, as uh, what the self-employed locum is offering to the NHS. Each one of these um, potential supplies is offering exactly the same thing. And therefore, it's not relevant in our submission to seek to characterize that main pays business because the relevant question is to characterize what is supplied, which is what is provided. I don't understand why it's not relevant to look at what main pays business is because this is this is main pays business is making these supplies. Yes, but if that if if that's a different question to to, to looking at the supply, you, for example, if you had two people offering exactly the same thing in terms of what the customer would receive, but one, you characterize their wider businesses in different ways. As a matter of VAT law, particularly bearing in mind the principle of fiscal neutrality, those suppliers have to be treated in the same way because they are, from the point of view of the customer, with the, the typical customer, the same. And so for example, if MainPay decided to sell a sandwich, you wouldn't say, well, MainPay is clearly enrolled in payroll. It can't possibly be supplying a sandwich. This must be something to do with payroll. You say, well, no, what is actually supplied is a sandwich. The same way here, and you're looking at that from the point of view of the customer, the same way here, what is supplied is the medical service of the doctor, and that's the same irrespective of whether you view main pay as um, a payroll type company or, or, or something else or a personal service company. What is being provided, what is being supplied, is the same in both cases. Doesn't that beg the very question to be answered in this case, is whether those two things are equivalent, whether a direct supply is, for VAT purposes, the same as an indirect supply, in other words, whether main pay is providing medical services or something else, and that is the very question. So we have to go right back to first principles really, to ask ourselves how we answer that question, and we answer it by looking at the economic and commercial reality of the whole, don't we? My lady, it's right that we have to go back to first principles, and I'm going to take you to the case law shortly. But I still would emphasize that, that what you're characterizing is the economic reality of the supply. And that depends on the, 
objective characteristics of what is supplied, mm. not on what may be thought to be the objective characteristics of what may appear as wider bits. Yeah. Now that I said, you can have two people carrying on objectively different businesses, but making objectively the same supply because it is the same from the point of view of the customer, and those supplies will be treated the same. With that introduction, what I propose to do, if, if I may, is take you through um, some of the important cases. I think there's four cases that I, I consider to be particularly important. And you'll, you'll notice, or will have already noticed, as you go through the cases, the same points come up again and again. And I've handed you a document which seeks to distill what I um, suggest are the principles we will see again and again as we go through the case law, or at least um, in some of the cases. Um, and it may save the court taking uh, a, a note, though I offer it for whatever, whatever it's um, worth. But the first case I'd like to take the court to, please, is the Kugler case. And that's in the authorities bundle behind tab 19. question, or the first question at paragraph 20, was whether the exemption in C applied only to natural persons. And when I say the exemption in C, I, I do that because you'll notice we're referring here to Article 13A1C, which is the predecessor legislation, but the, the, the distinction between B and C was the same under that legislation. So if I refer to B or C, it doesn't matter because they're the same under both. Twenty-one, you can see the court setting out the argument of the Berlin Tax Authority that only natural persons can fall within the sea. Notably, perhaps at twenty-two, you can see the German government itself didn't agree with the Berlin Tax Authority. And then, if we can go, please. 26. <clears throat> Sorry, at 25, you see that the, 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 the standard citation of the principle that, um, according to settled law, exemptions constitute independent concepts of law, which must be interpreted at an EU level. At 26, it says that the directive defines the exempt transactions by reference to the nature of the service supplied without mentioning the legal form of the person supplying them. And then at 27, on a literal interpretation, that provision does not require medical services to be supplied by a taxable person 
endow with a particular approval form in order for them to be exempt. Just two conditions need to be met. Medical services must be involved, and they must be supplied by persons who possess the necessary qualifications. And we'll see, we'll see um, this idea of just two conditions needing to be met being um, referred to again in later cases. But pausing there, in my submission, that's a very um, clear and important statement of what must be satisfied for exemption. And it, and it says just two conditions. Medical services must be involved, and they must be supplied by persons who possess the necessary qualifications. <coughs> the expression involved is very broad. Dare I ask, has anyone looked at the foreign language versions to see if the word involved is, for example, the same in the French version or of the judgment? I haven't. I, I mean, it's just it involved. It doesn't read. I mean, it's so broad. It, not certain, but it's very broad, isn't it? Well, it's, it, you read the two together. Medical services, um, it must be involved and must be supplied by someone who's qualified. So between those two um, pillars, you, you get a fairly clear idea of what it's talking about. Twenty-eight, we see reference to the principle um, of strict interpretation. The court says that interpretation is not contradicted by the court's case law according to which the exemptions are to be interpreted strictly since they constitute exceptions. And at 29, exemption of medical care, medical services supplied by legal persons is consistent with the objective of reducing the, medical co the cost of medical care and with the principle of fiscal neutrality inherent in the common system of VAT in compliance with which the exemptions provided for in Article 30 must be applied. The principle of fiscal neutrality precludes inter alia economic operators carrying on the same activities from being treated differently as far as the levying of VAT is concerned. It follows that that principle will be disregarded if the possibility of relying on the exemptions, which is envisaged for the provision of medical care, were dependent on the legal form in which the taxable person carries on his activity. The answer to the first question must therefore be that the exemption envisaged in C is not dependent on the legal form of the taxable person supplying the medical care. <coughs> in my submission, Kugel is a, a significant case because you see the court applying the purpose of the exemption, which is to reduce the cost of medical care to confirm and adopt an interpretation that's broader than it, it necessarily needed to be. The court could have said, no, obviously only people, only natural persons can be members of a profession, therefore the exemption is limited to those persons. But it didn't. It said that would breach fiscal neutrality and be inconsistent with the purpose. And so when you're looking at the question of whether medical services are provided by a person with the relevant qualifications, you're not looking at the taxpayer, or not, you don't, that's not the, if the taxpayer is a legal person, you're looking at the person who actually provides the service. In that case, it was the underlying individuals, the natural persons with the qualifications. Providing there, as it were, an agent of the taxpayer, i.e. an employee. Um, Yes, I mean, I'm not sure it would matter how the how the worker came to be engaged by the by Kugler. I don't think it would be different if Kugler had a mixture of employees and self-employed persons in each case. And in each case, Kugler was on supplying medical care. The point is that as long as the underlying person supplying the care on behalf of Kugler in that case have the qualifications, then the exemption can apply. So if some, if an agency, if a company, let's say MainPay was nothing more than an introduction agency. Yes. So you registered with MainPay, and you didn't, you weren't employed by them. You remained self-employed at all times. 
and they, as it were, gave you an entree into an NHS trust and identified a vacancy, phoned the, the trust up and said, we've got Dr X available for you, would main pay then be providing a medical service? No, but in that, in that scenario, my lord, you've got a supply direct from the, the, the doctor to the NHS. You don't have any yeah. um, supply from the doctor to the main pay. So it does, in that instance, it depends upon the fact that the doctor, in your scenario, is employed, employed, so that the employer is, so the agent, the service of the employees, in a sense, the service of the company, in an ordinary company law sense. Um, not quite, my lord. So there's, there's, there's two ways you can, this is the, in fact, the point of a deco, you, there's two ways you can set up that sort of arrangement. You can either have an introductory service where I, I may pay introduce you, the doctor, to the NHS and I receive a commission from someone. In that case, I'm simply supplying introductory services, that's not medical care. The doctor makes a direct supply to the NHS. Or you could have, and this was the finding at Ergo, you could have a supply from a doctor to, um, the, to the um, intermediary main pay, who then on supplies to the NHS. Um, so, the, the distinction doesn't so much turn on whether they're employee or self-employed. The distinction turns upon the direction of supply. Is the supply going to main pay, either as main pay's employee or worker, or however you want to characterize it, so that they are um, become part of our supply, and then we on supply their services to the NHS, or is it direct? But if it's just an introductory service, then it would be direct. Further important point uh, about Kugler in my respectful submission is that given the, the intense focus on fiscal neutrality and the purpose of the exemption of reducing the cost of medical care, it would be it would undermine this decision if what the court actually meant is is, is that yes, Kugler, you can exempt your supply because the underlying service is provided by a qualified professional. But if you buy in those services of doctors in order to make that supply, that supply by the doctor to you is taxable. And that would under fundamentally undermine the judgment because in that case, you would get a doctor who charges VAT to Kugler. Kugler cannot recover that VAT because Kugler is an exempt business. And therefore, Kugler ends up bearing the sticking VAT and must therefore charge a higher price to recover it. And you end up in exactly the same situation as if Kugler had to charge VAT in the first place. So if you put some figures on that, let's say the, the doctor charges 100 to Kugler, and Kugler um, has to pass on this cost, so it just operates at cost. If the doctor doesn't have to charge VAT, then you Google it, cost Google it 100 pounds, and they charge the end user 100 pounds. So the, the end user gets the benefit of reduced cost of medical care. And the court was saying, well, if we if we exclude exemption, then Google is going to have to charge 120 pounds. And so the end user's got an extra 20 pounds to, to pay for their medical care. And that's contrary to the purpose of the exemption. We don't want that. Google, you're exempt. But if Google buys in the services of a doctor and those bought in services, are subject to VAT. The doctor has to charge Kugler VAT, 120 pounds. Kugler doesn't recover any VAT, but Kugler now has to charge the customer 120. And you're in exactly the same position as if Kugler was just liable to VAT. And so, again, bearing in mind the purpose of the exemption, it would be inconsistent with the purpose of the exemption to charge VAT on supplies upstream of the final service provider. The, the questions referred in this case, I mean, I understand the point you're making, and it's fairly clear from the judgment. It, this wasn't a, a judgment by the court on the facts. It was about a very legal, narrow legal point about question, does the tax exemption apply only where the medical care is provided by an individual, or can it also apply when it's provided through another corporate structure? So they were answering that question. That's not the same question that the tribunal was asking, which was more multifactorial. But I understand your point. I mean, it, it, it's not an answer, but it helps you. It helps well, me. It helped. The upper tribunal didn't ignore corporate structure, did they? And they didn't say anything which was inconsistent with this judgment. 
Well, they, they, with respect to the other tribunal, in my submission, they did misapply the purpose of the exemption because they said the purpose of the exemption is to exempt medical care in situations falling within the exemption. And that's why my skeleton argument, I say that's circular. Because in order to know whether you fall within the purpose, you also need to know whether you fall within the exemption already. And therefore, the purpose can never help you understand the scope of the exemption. And uh, my learner friends don't repeat that framing of the purpose in, in their skeleton argument. They refer to the case law expression of purpose, which is simply in terms of reducing the cost of medical care. So, as I submitted in my skeleton argument, with respect, the upper tribunal did misapply. Wasn't the upper tribunal there, so I'm sure you'll take us to it, and I don't mean to take you out of sequence, um, but wasn't the upper tribunal there really just saying there are limits to how far the exemption goes? You can't go beyond, even with a purpose of construction, there are some, sometimes you just can't solve all the problems in the world. And I think there are a couple of examples in the cases, aren't there? where it's been a sort of medical-ish type of service, but it hasn't fallen within exemption because it's just outside the provisions of the directive, and you end up with tax coming into the system, and it's just, that's sometimes how it works. My lady, if, if, they, if they were saying that, that would be a very fair thing to say. Yeah. But um, the, word, the way they phrased it in my submission lends itself to, uh, to the interpretation that I, I understood by it, which is the, is the well, it says in, in quite straightforward terms, and we will come to it later, that the purpose is to reduce the cost of medical care for situations falling within the, the yeah. purpose of exemption. Yeah, yeah, and I take, I take your, what you say, that creates a circle. I mean, yeah. I, I understand that. And, and what, what I'm, I mean, Kugel is a very good example where the court, the court used the purpose to adopt a broader approach to the interpretation of the, of the exemption. And so clearly the purpose can assist in adopting a broader interpretation. Um, where otherwise, if you were applying simply a strict interpretation... Well, the, the court in Kugler said legal personality isn't something that's specified in the exemption and we're not going to read it in. It's not there as a criterion or condition to be met. So it doesn't matter on the facts of Kugler whether you're a company supplying medical yes. services or you're a doctor who yes. goes to see your patients directly. I mean, th those things don't matter. That, that's what Kugler said, wasn't it? Y yes, my lady, but you, 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 you can at least see the... the, the the, the literal basis for the argument of the Berlin Tax Authority that, well, hang on, these are services provided by qualified professionals. Mm -hmm. The only qualified professional is the natural person. That mm -hmm. does at least make sense. Mm -hmm. And the court said, no, that's not the right interpretation, and, and gave the interpretation what it refers to. We, we don't know in Kugler what the contractual relationship between the doctors and Kugler was. Do we? we don't know if they were employees or, or they provided services or whatever. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. I mean, the, the no, we've only got the judgment here. We don't have the opinion, which no, might have the more opinion. facts. But um, we do have the opinion. We yes. have got the opinion. Yeah, Tizano. But the, the, oh, the previous. If I may, because in my my submission, there's a Kira case on precisely this point, which is the Peters case, yeah. which I'll come to later, which was ex precisely concerned with the taxation and the remuneration of somebody working for a lab company that then provided lab services to doctors. So I think that's. In my submission, the clearest case. That's, that's your best example that's of an upstream supply, isn't it? Yeah. That then gets incorporated into an on, onward medical supply. Yes. The second case I'd like to, to take you to in, in some detail, if I may, is the LUP case. closer to, in fact it does involve upstream services, because if we look yes, at yeah. um, paragraph 9, on, um, paragraph 9, LUP is a private limited company under German law whose sole shareholder, Dr. Sharman, a pathologist, it carries out medical tests inter alia for companies operating laboratories with which are affiliated the general practitioners who prescribe those tests as part of the care they provide. So here you've got <coughs> a laboratory carried on by LUP, a, a company, who's supplying med or carrying out medical tests on behalf of laboratories. And it, 
it seemed that those in the laboratories were affiliated with the general practitioners who asked the laboratories to do the tests. So it seems that the sequence is the patient comes to see the GP, the GP says to the main laboratory, can you do this medical test, please? The main laboratory goes to LUP and says, please, can you do this test for this patient? And so you see you've got a, a, a chain of supply there, whereby LUP is supplying to the main laboratory, who then provides the service to the GP, so the GP can use them in their diagnosis of the patient. And the, the tax authority said that those supplies by LUP to the main laboratory were taxable. see at paragraph 15 that the, the point the National Court was concerned about was that whilst medical tests assist in the diagnosis of patients and can thus be regarded as medical care, the laboratories carrying out those tests do not generally provide their services in the context of a relationship of trust, query whether that precludes the application of the exemption. Paragraph 20, please, under the heading, the exemption of services are issued in the main proceedings. As observed by the National Court, services of a medical nature may come within the exemptions provided for in B and C of the directive. There's then a reference to the, the, this point about place of supply, but given that's not being pursued, and in fact it's dealt with in later cases, I won't dwell on it. And in fact, you see in 23, the observation that it should be ascertained, so it's about five lines down, so it should be ascertained whether those tests nevertheless may be medical care within the meaning of that provision or the provision of medical care within C. If that is so, the test will be exempt irrespective of where they carry out. And the, sorry, the point there is that the national court seemed to think this was closely related to medical care. Whereas the Court of Justice is saying, actually, have you, have you considered actually the fact that it might be medical care in its own right? Because making sure that the National Court gets the right answer to the, the, the questions it may or may not have asked. At paragraph 24, we, know, we see uh, another statement of some general principles. First, it refers to the principle of strict interpretation, since they constitute exceptions. But then it goes on to say, however, the interpretation of the terms used in that provision must be consistent with the objectives pursued by those exemptions and comply with the requirements of the principle of fiscal neutrality inherent in the system of VAT. At 25, you see another statement of the purpose. They both have the objective of reducing the cost of health care. Twenty-seven. It follows that the concept of medical care in B and the provision of medical care in C, the same provision, are both intended to cover services which have as their purpose the diagnosis, treatment, and so far as possible cure of disease or health disorders. Born in mind that whilst medical care and the provision of medical care must have a therapeutic aim, it does not necessarily follow that the therapeutic aim purpose of service must be confined with a particularly narrow compass. And it goes on to talk about prophylactic care. <coughs> Nothing turns and disappear on whether a particular service was medical or not. No, no. In those circumstances, as maintained by LUP at the hearing, and that's not acknowledged as being possible by the National Court and Commission, the court finds that in light of the objective of reducing health care costs pursued by the above mentioned exemptions, medical tests such as those initiated in the main proceedings, which have as their purpose the observation and examination of patients for prophylactic purposes, 
may constitute medical care within the meaning of B or the provision of medical care within C. This interpretation is moreover consistent with the principle of fiscal neutrality, which precludes similar, treating similar suppliers of services which are thus in competition with each other differently for VAT purposes. And contrary to that principle, to make medical tests prescribed by general practitioners subject to a different VAT scheme, depending on whether they are carried out when they, when they are equi equivalent quality from the equivalent from the qualitative point of view in the light of the professional qualification of the service provider in question. And that, I say, supports the one of the introductory points I made, which is we'll look at this from the point of view of the customer, what's being provided. From a qualitative point of view, you get exactly the same thing in terms of the medical service of the doctor, whether they come through main pay or they come directly. It's exactly the same thing. Um, and that supports the point that they should be treated and taxed in the same way. So the services at issue here were, were the services of luck, weren't they, which was the company that was, of which the um, pathologist doctor was the sole member of the company, is that yes. right? So it was his company, and yes. he was doing pathology tests and analyses in a laboratory distant from the GPs, but on behalf of the GPs. So just to be clear about the facts, that's what's going on in this Yes, it, it, it looks like it could be some sort of personal service company arrangement, yeah. but yes, it's, you've got a sole director shareholder who has the qualifications. He is providing services through his company to the main laboratory, who are then using, on, passing on the results to the GP, who then uses them yeah. to the medical. Yes. And, what, and, and I'm not saying anything other than just the difference in the facts here. You, I, you may say it's, it's an irrelevant difference, but if we want to provide the analog or translate that to what's happening here, we do have to put in main pay in A&E, don't we, somewhere in the sequence between the doctor and the hospital that's receiving the doctor's services. Yes, so in, in this case, main pay would be LUP, A&E would be... LUP with a, diff with a bit of a difference because it's not, the, the, the doctors aren't shareholders and there's, there's a much less proximate relationship between main pay and the doctors on its books. Yes, but that goes to my submission that what you're looking at is what's provided. Understood, and I understand all that. And then you've got an A&E interposed as well. So, the a so, so there you've got LUP, main laboratory GP patient. Here you've got main pay, A&E, NHS, patient. So main pay is in the position of LUP in terms of, and I take my, lady, I take my your point that the doctors aren't shareholders of main pay, but in terms of what is actually provided from a qualitative point of view, it's the medical service of the doctor, which is then passed along and ultimately benefits the patient and reduces the cost of healthcare. It's not liable to VAT. Mm -hmm. As I understand the facts, that this was effectively an incorporated individual. I think that's that, that's what it looks like. It looks like. I mean, I was just looking at the Advocate, Gen um, Advocate General Madura's opinion, paragraph three, which seems to suggest it was simply an individual. It, yes, my, my lady says that's not. That's just a descriptor of these facts. Yes, uh, and and, and uh, as I said at the beginning, you've got various different setups by which a, a doctor could provide their services to the NHS. One of which would be through a personal service company, and HMRC's argument is that it doesn't matter if you go direct through your personal service company or through main pay, none of those are exempt because all you're doing is facilitating, facilitating a supply <coughs> medical care by another. I think H I mean, they might be wrong about that. They might be wrong. I mean, one of my questions to you is, to both of you is, has anybody ever actually litigated the self-employed doctor supplying services to a hospital? And to my knowledge, nobody has ever litigated that, and there may well be arguments about how you characterise that, that particular supply and whether it is exempt or taxable. So HMRC might be wrong about the self-employed doctor. Yes. Um, but they have two arguments, as I understand it. First of all, they say the self-employed doctor does have to charge tax on their services, and you say that's just plain wrong. But secondly, I think they make the point on the facts that on the facts here, you have more intermediaries in the way, so you're not comparing like with like when you look at a self-employed doctor. Yes. Just works like Mr. Luck did or whatever the pathologist was called. Yes. So, so that's, well, that's it, it may... My lady, that may well be correct, but they, they put it in, in two ways and rely also on the intermediation. So these cases, in particular, LUP and Peters, are good examples of my submission of showing that intermediation or the chain of supply does not affect um, its characterization, characterization as medical care. And if we can go forward then, please, to... And, and your, your logic would apply, howsoever complex the 
corporate web of relationships was on the particular facts. You could have three, four, five, six intermediary companies. You could have a virtual company doing nothing but putting people, you know, getting, I mean, the, the, the trigger, you say, is that if they are employees, whatever happens thereafter is utterly irrelevant from a corporate structure point of view. From an organizational structure point of view, I think that's, that's correct, my lord. I'm going I'm to show you, I'm showing you the cases in the medical context that I say are most relevant to that question, but there's also two cases outside that context, Canterbury and SEB, which I say support this proposition that the organizational structure shouldn't matter. Um, and, and you can see, particularly in the context of, of, of medical exemption, where the purpose is to reduce the cost of healthcare, it would, it would not make sense to say, yes, the final supply is exempt, but everything up to that is taxable, because then you just end up with a whole load of built up sticking VAT, <coughs> which then has to be incorporated into the what admittedly exempt price of the customers. The customer doesn't end up benefiting, or the cost of healthcare is not reduced in, in the way the exemption exists. I suppose the, the answer to that is who knows what goes on behind the scenes, given it's all public money. It could wash around and come back in, in all sorts of different ways. Well, my, uh, yes, that doesn't, I'm not certain that necessarily tells you that the price of healthcare has gone up or down simply because tax has been applied. My, my lord, I mean, if that's a reference to my learned friend's argument about what well, the NHS is funded from taxation, then my, my answer to that is in the supplemental skeleton, which is that these are independent concepts of EU law and it cannot matter how a particular member state chooses to fund their healthcare system. And the arguments they make within any event apply to private healthcare as well. Um, so that yes. argument that the NHS it happens to be funded understood. on it. Um, my submission is no, no, we understand that. not irrelevant. Um, but just, just picking up this, this point about activities upstream, at paragraph 37, please, of the LUP decision, the Commission's argument that it follows from the case law concerning exemptions that activities carried out upstream from those providing provided by the ultimate service provider are not exempt Sorry, which paragraph are you? 37, my lady. So, the Commission's arguing that activities carried out upstream of those provided by the ultimate service provider are not exempt, and then after the case law, so that only medical tests carried out by laboratories on behalf of patients in the context of a direct contractual relationship with those patients comes within the scope of D, must also be rejected. As that case law relates to the interpretation of other exemptions, the wording and objectives of which are different from those pursued by the provision. That's saying it doesn't matter if your patient isn't in a direct contractual relationship or isn't sitting in the consulting room with a particular medical provider. So that's saying it's a broader it, it's, exemption it's, than that. So, it's so you've got in this in this scenario you've got an alternate service provider who presumably is the GP, mm. and then you've got persons upstream of yep. that activity facilitating and contributing to what the GP yep. can offer. Yep. And the court is rejecting, in my submission, the argument that those activities yep. upstream shouldn't be exempt. Exactly. So that was what LUP was important for, is it was saying you don't have to be sitting in the consult yes. consultation room at the time with the patient yes. in order to be providing medical services. You can be an upstream. You can be upstream. But again, I just want to look at the facts here. What we've got is doctors working in the hospital. You are actually providing mm -hmm. services in the hospital to the patient. So that bit of LUP doesn't matter to us because we're not talking about upstream in the sense of somebody outside the hospital providing laboratory services or whatever that the hospital then buys in. We're talking about doctors in the hospital doing their jobs. But without a direct contractual relationship with no the patient. No direct contractual relationship with the patient. And so that's, that's, I, that's, I think, the relevance is that the commission was saying, no, you need a direct contractual relationship with the ultimate beneficiary, the patient, and that things upstream of that, through a, a web of contracts, in, in that case sort of a sequence of um, contracts, are not exempt. And the court says, no, in light of the objectives of this particular exemption, we don't accept that of activities upstream where you don't have that direct contractual relationship are exempt. And that, we say, has, has force in the present context. Yes, our doctors don't have a direct contract relationship. We don't have a direct contractual relationship. Uh, well, the NHS probably doesn't I don't think the NHS has a direct contractual yes. relationship. So, so that, I mean, rather than contractual, I've always understood this bit to mean you don't have to be sitting in the consultation room with the patient to 
be providing medical services because you can have an upstream supply distant in some circumstances. I, 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 I would respectfully submit it, it also says you don't have to have a direct relationship with the patient. So that's a, probably a better phrase in the context of the NHS where there isn't, as my lady says, contract. But the point is you don't have to have a direct relationship. If you, your relationship might be with, your, with, with a, an intermediary laboratory who has a relationship with a GP, and the GP has a relationship, and the court is saying no, those upstream activities, because they contribute to the medical care ultimately provided, can be exempt. And that also fulfills the objective. Can I just ask you about, I'm trying to, to understand the implications of paragraph 38. Yes, my lord. And the, the text in line 5 that remains responsible to the patient for the, anal patient for the analysis, is it being suggested that retaining some degree of responsibility to the patient is relevant to the provision of medical services? But you, if you are. No, my lord, that's, that's, that's to do with the Commission of France decision. Um, and what they're saying there is if you subcontract to another, if one laboratory subcontracts to another laboratory, <coughs> then the subcontracting still benefits from exemption. I, I see they say that. It's, it's those words. I wonder if that it's assumed that in either scenario there will be some degree of retention responsibility to the patient. What not, I must say, I don't find this easy to... In my submission they're saying is that where laboratory one has a relationship and responsibility to the patient, that's exempt. No, one, no one's arguing with that. But if that laboratory then subcontracts the performance of a test to another laboratory, but the first laboratory retains all responsibility to the patient so that the laboratory two doesn't have that responsibility to the patient, that supply from laboratory two to laboratory one can still be exempt, is, is what I submitted saying there, which okay. I believe was the outcome in, in Commission of France. I see, yes. Uh, and you can see the same point, or a similar point being made into, in relation to the Ambrun criminal, uh, in relation to where the, the services supply to an employer and insurer in certain circumstances. I mean, it depends then. Then you do get into the question of what is the purpose, because if the purpose is, for example, to um, work out what damages to claim in a professional negligence case, that's not medical care. But if it's to facilitate in some way the, the health protect the health of the employee or the insured, then that can be medical care, and in which case the court said in Denver now that it doesn't matter that the service is being supplied to the insurer and the employee, or even that, that it also serves the separate purposes of the employer and the insurer. Um, but so, the, I see, so, so, so in this example, lab two is providing medical services which are exempt to lab one. Lab one, lab one is providing medical services which are exempt and it's lab one that retains responsibility for the patient. Correct. But both lab A and lab B are themselves providing medical services. Correct. So I think I've got two more key cases in the medical arena that I would like to show you, and then if I may just show you those two non-medical cases which talk about organisational structure, the Canterbury case and the SEC. The next case then is the Peters case, which is my lady, um, foreshadowed is, I think, in my submission, the closest to what we're looking at here. That's behind tab 34, please. Paragraph 7. Mr. Peters is a medical specialist in clinical chemistry and laboratory diagnostics. Between 2009 and 2012, he provided medical care services to LADR, a laboratory company supplying laboratory services for doctors working in medical practices and hospitals. Nine, he received monthly remuneration of 6,000 euros for those services, which included in particular providing evaluation services 
aimed at specific laboratory physician diagnoses, as well as medical assistance in transfusion medicine measures in specific treatment scenarios. He didn't, Mr. Peters did not charge VAT on that remuneration. So what you have here is Mr. Peters, who is qualified, a qualified medical specialist, providing his services to LADR for £6,000 a month. And then LADR supplies laboratory services to doctors. And the key issue is the taxation of those payments for Mr. Peters. The key, it was whether he should have charged VAT on his services. Should he have charged, yes, should he have charged VAT on his supplies of services. Do we know what precise services he was supplying? They're described as medical care. It's in, it's in, no, my lord, um, included in particular evaluation services aimed at specific laboratory physician diagnoses, as well as medical assistance in transfusion medicine measures in specific treatment scenarios. So it's a traditional medical service, there's no, I mean, they're rather vague, evaluation services. Yeah. A diagnostic service, a medical diagnostic service, is that what we're looking at, really? Um, Looks, anyway, I mean, we... Also in relation to trans... I don't profess to understand <laughs> the, the nuances of what but, that might involve. Or, or, or we, I think we can conclude is that, that those are medical services. That's a traditional medical service. Yes, in the same way that the, what the doctors, in this case, provide are traditional medical services. And, and it's important, I say, to look, to notice that the court is looking looking at what did Mr. Peters actually do, which was he did these medical type things. And then if you look at what did our doctors actually do, they did um, provide a medical care. And so the question, the, that, that's why I say this case is, is, is the closest we have, because we have a person supplying their services to a company, and therefore they, they're not acting independently of the company. Rather, what they're doing is facilitating a supply of medical care by the company. The contracts with the medical company to the, so there would be, we have to postulate, there would have been contracts in place between LADR and let's say the GP practices for the supply by LADR of these of, of diagnostic or evaluative services. Yes. So that's what the contracts would have said they're yes. supplying. And you would have seen LADR um, almost like an outsourcing arrangement, providing certain, anyway, supplementing the care that yes. the GPs could give to their patients. Yes, and how does LADR fulfill those um, obligations, it engages Mr. Peters, who is the expert, and Mr. Peters provides his services to the laboratory company, which then allows it to fulfill its commitments to the GPs, which allows them to provide the medical care to the patient. And, and, and therefore, if, if those services are exempt, I say that there's a, a very close analogy with the types of the situation here, because what you're saying is exempt there is precisely a supply made by Mr. Peters to facilitate the supply by LADR to the doctor, who in turn, and so you're, you're actually two steps removed there from the final patient. Um, Except that you wouldn't, an, an ordinary, again, it's just to just to try and work out how all these, because the facts are always very important in these cases, so just to try and work out where the differences might be, that LADR was a, um, very long name. It's a laboratory company supplying laboratory services for doctors working in medical practices, rehab, public health services, and hospitals. That is not a description you could apply to MainPay. MainPay does something very different, isn't it? MainPay supplies the medical services for doctors. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yes, I would not apply that. But that's why you have to come back to the company law point, which is the company provides such services as its employees provide. There's not. There's no distinction. Yes, my lord. Between. Yes, my lord. When, when, when a doctor, when a Maypay employee doctor um, provides those medical services, it's doing so because it's an employee of Maypay. Yeah, that is Maypay. On your analysis, yes. Maypay provides the services which are provided by yes. its employees. Yes, Maypay has a contractual obligation to provide the medical services of the doctor. How does it fulfil that when it sends this particular doctor to that? Provides. Yeah, sends the doctor to the hospital. Um, to, 
do that. And, and similarly here, there's, there's the laboratory providing diagnostic services to doctors. How does the laboratory fulfill those? They went well in engages Mr. Peters to provide services to it for £6,000 a month. And the, que the key question is whether Mr. Peters is taxable on, on the, his part of services. They're quite narrow questions, aren't they? As is often the case. The first one is the relationship between B and C. The second one is about relationship of trust. Or confidence. Yes, and, and, and well, that those yeah, the questions are, are formulated in those terms. And then at seventeen, you see, you see by its first question, the referring court asks in essence whether B and C of the directive must be interpreted as meaning the provision of medical care, such as that an issue in the main proceedings supplied by a medical specialist in a clinical chemistry laboratory diagnostics <coughs> is capable of falling within the exemptions of under C. So, as the court often does, it reformulates it. To but it does, it was the, the, the que six, question at 16.1 is, is a binary, is it B or C? Yeah. And they've slightly reframed the question as, as what are the characteristics of either? Yeah. At 18, they tell us that the case law on B um, provides um, assistance in interpreting C because they must be interpreted in the same way. At 20, we see further reference to um, what medical care is. It's clear from the case of the court that the concept of medical care in B and provision of medical care in C are both intended to cover services that have as their aim the diagnosis, treatment, and so far as possible cure of diseases or health disorders. Services are of sufficient quality, 
without the existence of a confidential relationship between the patient and the person providing the care and being discussed in that regard. And that, that's a point you see, you, well, you see in that reference to the Solovell case, where they talk about why, why do we have this limit? What is the purpose of limiting it, limiting it to qualified persons? Well, it's about ensuring sufficient quality of care. Then it refers to um, what the court has said about the distinction between B and C. And in that context, it has referred to whether the service is provided outside a hospital and within the framework of a confidential relationship. But at 36, the court says, however, it cannot follow from those findings that the exemption under C applies only to the provision of medical care within the framework of a confidential relationship. It must be noted the purpose of those findings was merely to highlight the differences between the provision, between that provision and B of the directive with respect to defining the field of application to the exemption. And so what, what you see here is, is the National Court was saying, well, actually, have, have you implicitly referred to additional conditions or, or implications into Article 132.1c? The court's saying, no, we, we referred that just to sort of illustrate the general frame of operation, but there are not additional conditions. And then you see that um, at 41... Referring to Kugler, although the court set out in paragraph 27 of that judgment the conditions to which the exemption referred to in that provision is subject, it did not refer in that regard to the existence of a confidential relationship between the patient and the person providing the care. And if you remember, that was the statement in Kugler that just two things, conditions must be satisfied, medical services must be involved, and they must be provided by a suitably qualified person. So you have here the court saying that was the test, that's what, what we meant. And so the end result was that Mr. Peter's services were exempt. So what, what, pulling the threads together from Peter's, what do you deduce? That the two conditions are the gravamen of the analysis. The existence or absence of a confidential relationship is not decisive. Yes. If there is a confidential relationship, which then I suppose there might be, between your employees and the patient, that would be one factor which you'd pray and aid, but it's not, not decisive either way. Um, well, and I suppose to you, the contrary, then the court's saying that's that's not relevant, that's not part of the test. The test is simply, are medical services being provided? And are they being provided by a suitably qualified person? Okay. And in that case, they were. And in that case, as I emphasized at the beginning, what was happening was Mr. Peters was simply providing his own personal services to a company. Yes, he was a suitably qualified person, therefore he could benefit from the exemption. But it was as upstream of the final, ultimate provision of care to the patient. And what he was doing by providing his personal services to the company was facilitating the provision of medical care ultimately by the GP or the doctor, but also facilitating the supply of medical care by um, LADR. Does it therefore take matters very much, apart from the factual difference, very much further than Kugler? Well, it, 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 it does, my lord, because this is a, a very clear example where an individual provided their so, own Except the facts are different, but apart from that, the, so far the principles of law are concerned, it's the two conditions you say are relevant. Yes. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's direct or indirect through a company. Yes. You say. Yes. And, and it, it illustrates very clearly that this concept that my learned friend has, uh, if you facilitate the supply of medical care by another, yeah. then you're not providing medical care yourself. You must be wrong with respect. How do they explain 
I'll tell you how he explains Peter Lynch. Um, but I, that, that is, in my submission, the closest we um, to the present circumstances, and, and it's therefore very telling and helpful to my case, in my submission, that Mr. Peters was exempt, because if personal services of Mr. Peters can be exempt, then logically our provision of services must also be exempt. There's no rational difference. case in the medical arena that I'd like to take you through in a little bit of detail if I may is the X case which is over the tab we see at paragraph 5 that X is a limited liability company it provided telephone consultations on various topics related to healthcare and patient support it also conducted by telephone patients suffering from chronic and long-term illnesses, sorry, patient support programs, by telephone with patients suffering from long-term illnesses on behalf of statutory health insurance fund. Those services were carried out by nurses and medical assistants, but also doctors could become involved. And you can see in paragraph seven that the format of the consultation involved software-assisted assessment and advice at the end of it. You can see in paragraph 11, ultimately the issue was that X wanted those services to be exempt. And at 16, we get to the first question. By its first question, the referring court asks, in essence, whether services provided by telephone consisting of providing adv advice relating to healthcare are able to come within the VAT exemption in C. It follows from a literal interpretation of C that directed that the provision of a service must be exempt, must be exempt, if it satisfies two conditions. Namely, first, that it constitutes the provision of medical care, and second, that it is carried out in the exercise of the medical and paramedical profession. Again, that's the Cougar point. Two conditions. If those are satisfied, they must be exempt. There's no room for um, adding in further conditions. At paragraph 19, in that regard, it must be noted that C refers solely in the wording of the first condition set out to the concept of the provision of medical care without mention of any fact in relation to the location of the provision of service. And as you see, it's 21. Accordingly, it follows from that that for Article 1. 132.1c to apply a service which fulfills the conditions referred to in that provision is capable of coming within the exemption laid down in that provision regardless of where it's provided. At 23, sorry, at 22 you have fiscal neutrality again. And at 23, in view of all those factors, it should be noted that the provision of care provided by telephone is capable of coming within the VAT exemption laid down in C if it fulfills all the conditions to apply that exemption. Furthermore, that consideration is consistent with the underlying aim of that directive, which namely the reduction of the cost of healthcare and making healthcare more accessible to individuals. At 28, you see again um, the court explaining what provision of healthcare refers to. In that regard, according to settled case law, the concept of provision of medical care is intended, intended to cover services that have as their aim the diagnosis, treatment, and insofar as possible cure of disease. 29, however, it does not necessarily follow that the therapeutic aim purpose of the service must be combined within a particularly narrow compass. And then talks about services maintaining and restoring health. 30, in the context of that analysis, the lack of a medical prescription prior to the telephone consultation is insufficient, depending on whether such a consultation comes within the concept of provision of medical care. And then 31, in the present case, consultations which consist of explaining diagnoses and potential therapies, as well as
are suggesting changes to treatment follows since they enable the person to concerned to understand his or her medical situation and as the case may be to take action as a result in particular by taking or not taking medication are likely to have a therapeutic purpose and on that basis are covered in the scope of provision of medical care. And when you apply that to what our doctors were doing, you come to the same conclusion. They were providing medical care. tribunal set out a summary of the conclusions it drew from European law in paragraph 89. In that summary, it doesn't refer to the two conditions anywhere. It cites Kugler yes. extensively. It never refers to Kugler paragraph 27. No, and this, this was the, 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 my first ground of appeal, was that in, in the upper tribunal decision, I think the other tribunal do recognise just two conditions must be met, but it doesn't say which one is not met and why it's not met. I'm just looking at their summary of the law, which yes. doesn't include that, so far as I can see. No, and then... But that's your starting point. That, that is the starting point. It's the, it's, it's the agreed starting point in this court. My mm -hmm. friend says that those, those questions about supply of staff, etc., were, were, were not, the, not the real question. The real question was terms of the exemption in the EU law, and as we've seen through the case law, just two conditions must be met. My 
Hearts and Missions, they're both in X. Um, and therefore, as you saw in, in X, if those conditions aren't met, it must be X. There's no room for saying, despite those conditions, it's met. Some other factor comes into play, stops it being X. The way the, tr the upper tribunal identified at least one of the key central or the key legal issues, which in paragraph 94 of their judgment really puts into focus what the correct test is, whether it's, if you like, the framework test, which I suppose you're saying is not the test laid down in European court judgments, no. or the alternative is the control over clinical decision making which is possibly closer to the two-part test, but it's not exactly the same. Neither, to be honest, map directly onto the case law you've read, and that's to be fair to his criticism of the approach taken so far. He says we went wrong in the FTT by focusing on this um, a distinction between supply of staff and, and medical exemption. We should have been just looking at whether it's medical, medical care by, by qualified person. Um, and he seeks in this court to bring us back to, to the words of the directive, and fine, I accept that. We must look at the words of the directive, see how it's interpreted in the case, and reply to these, these facts. And when you do that, you end up with just two conditions. And so, to be fair to the FTT, yes, it didn't have a, a, a focus on these questions, but it's part of the But it's staff business. I mean, it may just be a reordering of the arguments. It doesn't seem to me that it falls out of the equation altogether. Mm. You do focus on whether this is an exempt supply within the directive first and foremost, of course you do, but to answer that as I understand it, um, HMRC's position is it's not a supply of exempt medical services because it's a supply of something else and then you have to look at all the facts and economic and commercial reality and everything else and that's where the whole control question comes in because they say actually what's <coughs> happening is main pay is like an agency, it's just supplying staff to go and work in the hospital and that's why none of this case law applies. So I think it does, I don't think I don't think we can use the slight change of focus to say none of the supply of staff arguments matter. They do matter, but they come in at a different level. Well, on my, my learned friend's case, as I understand it, he says, I don't, I don't, I don't think he sets that, uh, this up as it, it's a supply of something else. He, he says, I'll, I'll, I'll he'll, he'll say it <laughs> what he actually says, but my understanding is that he says, no, no, the question is, is this medical care? And HMRC say it's not medical care. Why is it not medical? because what you're doing is facilitating a supply of medical care by someone else, the NHS in this case. And in that situation, the only person making the supply of medical care is the NHS. What he does say, as I understand it, is this, the, those references to the NHS um, having a framework <coughs> of control over the directors show that what you were doing was facilitating the supply of medical care by the NHS. And I, 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 I agree with him that we were facilitating a supply of medical care with a, by the NHS. So that, to that extent, um, th there's no dispute. Where I disagree with my learned friend is, is his submission, as a, which is a proposition of law, that where you're facilitating the supply of medical care by another, then you yourself are not supplying medical care. That's, that's, and that, that to my, in my submission, is um, an issue of law to be yeah. to be decided by examining the cases, and it's not an issue that was the focus in the tribunals below. To be fair to them, so I mean, yeah, it's correct that the tribunals below didn't focus on those two questions. Parties must take probably a lot of responsibility for that, if not all of it. Um, but 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 given where the arguments have got to, HMRC say supply of staff is not relevant. It's not a statutory concept. He's right. Focus on the words of the the, the legislation. And when we do that, and we look at the case law, we end up, as I said, with two simple questions. Two questions. Um, is it medical care? Is there provision of medical care? And are they appropriately qualified? But in answering that, again, I'm just trying to frame your, 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 your analysis. It comes back to what I very loosely and crudely call the company law point. If a company is, the mere fact that you've got legal personality involved, you say is irrelevant, that follows from Calder and the other cases. Yep. Once you strip that out of the equation, if the employee of a company is providing a service, directly or indirectly, then you say your argument is, so be it. That's the end of it. It's still yeah. exempt. Because uh, 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 that, is ex that is what I say. And, and because when you look at it, the NHS wants somebody to provide medical care to its patients. It wants someone to diagnose and treat them. What are we supplying? We're, we're supplying the 
the medical service of a doctor to diagnose and treat their patient, which is exactly what they wanted. And as you've seen from these cases, the focus is on what's actually done. And if what's actually done is a medical service, then the, the structure by which you get that, to the, that benefit to the ultimate patient doesn't matter. And I'm about to show you two cases in relation to other exemptions that I say assist in showing that organizational structure shouldn't affect the exemption. themselves members of England Hockey, a non-profit making organisation for the encouragement and development of the playing of hockey in England, and they pay affiliation fees on which England Hockey charges VAT. Eight, in consideration for the affiliation fees, England Hockey provides various services. Nine, the commissioners notify England Hockey that the affiliation fees it received in consideration for the services supplied to hockey clubs affiliated to it should be subject to VAT at the standard rate. As the clubs were not persons taking part in sport, those supplies were not fall within the exemption and the hockey club appealed. You can see it. There was some discussion in the lower courts about whether you can treat the hockey club as transparent, but by the time we get to a reference at paragraph 14, you can see that the referring court took the view that it was not legitimate to treat the hockey clubs as transparent for VAT purposes. But then it referred to certain questions. So the situation you've got here is England hockey making supplies to, a, 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 we'll call them a legal person, the hockey, Canterbury Hockey Club, and in turn they make supplies to the hockey players. The exemption, as you see, is for supplies to persons taking part in sport. The position of HMRC was, well, you, the hockey club, Canterbury, are not taking part in sport. You're a hockey club. Paragraph 
specify the exemptions under Article 13 are to be interpreted strictly since they constitute exceptions to the general principle of taxation. However, that requirement of strict interpretation does not mean that the terms used to specify those exemptions can be construed in such a way as to deprive them of their intended effect. Paragraph 19, as regards sport and physical education as activities in the public interest, the exemption under M is intended to encourage those types of activities, but is not a general exemption of all supplies or services linked to them. Paragraph 23, thus the exemption of a transaction is to be determined in particular on the basis of the nature of the service supplied and its relationship with sport and physical education. 24, in that context, it, it must be examined whether the argument advanced by the United Kingdom is based on the wording that natural persons alone are capable, capable of participating in sport and that consequently only services supplied directly to such persons may be exempted. Next, the reply to be given to the first question. 26, <coughs> in that regard, whilst it is true that the term persons is on its own wide enough to include not only natural persons, but also unincorporated associations and corporate persons, in normal linguistic usage, only natural persons take part in sport, even if it is done in terms of persons. So, and again, we'll see here the power of the purpose of the exemption, because the court is saying, yes, we agree with you on a normal linguistic reading of that provision. Only natural persons partake in sport. But that's not the conclusion the court reached. At 28, sport within such a structure... I'll just focus on 27. The, the distinction which the court appears to be drawing is the playing of sport and the creation of the environment in which sport can be provided. So, for example, in this case, the Hockey Association was providing accreditation, courses for umpires, development offices, mm. club management, and so on, which they say is sufficiently connected to sport. So is this case really about the breadth of the definition of the word sport? And who can provide those services? It's about who, 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 partake, who, who are the persons partaking in sport, uh, and how, do you, how can you get exemption? Because at yeah. 28, the reasoning of the court is that, well, certain sports essentially require or usually require some sort of organisational structure, for example, a hockey club, to be done... Exactly. So it's a broad definition of, if you like, participation in sport. Exactly. That, that's the problem, I would. Yeah. And, 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 but the way they get there is, is what I say is relevant, because they say, well, given that there are many sports that depend on some sort of organisational structure, yes. and the purpose of this exemption is to provide exemption in relation to supplies closely related to participation in sport, yeah. We would be undermining the purpose of that exemption if we restricted it only to supplies that are made directly to the natural person and couldn't include supplies to the hockey club. Mm. And therefore, that's why we interpret it as including supplies to a hockey club. Yeah. But 29, they make the point that large numbers of sport at the very bottom of the Page, such an interpretation would mean that a large number of supplies or services essential to sport would be automatically and inevitably excluded from the benefit of that exemption, irrespective of the question whether those services were directly linked to persons taking part in sport and who was the true beneficiary of those services. Such a result would, as the Commission correctly maintained, run counter to the purpose of the exemption provided for by that provision. And note there that looking at the ultimate beneficiary of the supply, and in our case, the ultimate beneficiary. At 30, it follows, besides, from that interpretation, the exemption for transactions affected by undertakings or organizations mentioned in M would not benefit from benefit certain persons who participate in sports solely because they participate in it within a structure managed by a club. That interpretation would not be consistent with the principle of fiscal neutrality inherent in the common system of VAT, in compliance with which the exemption provided for in Article 13 must be applied. In fact, that principle precludes, in particular, economic operators who affect the same transactions being treated differently in respect of the levying of VAT. 
it follows that the principle would be disregarded if the possibility of invoking the benefit of exemption under M of the Sixth Directive depended on the organizational structure, particularly for supporting activity and practice. And so that answers, along with the references to this when we tried to in the previous case, if my learned friend is running a, a backup case, that not only is this not medical care when it's applied directly by the doctor, but you have a further problem because you've got intermediaries through the, which the buy is ultimately made. My, my submission is that this is, this is the answer to that. The organizational structure cannot be used to undermine the exemption. And therefore, exemption does not depend on the organizational structure by which the benefit arrives at the ultimate user. At 31, in order to assure the effective application of exemption under M, that provision must be interpreted as meaning that services are supplied in connection with, among others, sports practice in groups of persons or within organizational structures put in place by sports clubs are generally eligible to benefit from the exemption. It follows that to determine whether suppliers of services are exempt, the identity of the material recipients of those services and the legal form under which they benefit are irrelevant. And again, we would say similar logic must apply here. If you, if you were to say, well, Yes, if the doctor had gone directly, that would be exempt. But because you've gone through one or two intermediaries, that's not exempt. Then you're, as I said, <coughs> undermining the purpose, where what matters is the, is the ultimate beneficiary and what's provided to them. I said the other case was SEP, -E actually it's Ludwig. Um, this concerned the financial services exemption. That's behind tab 25. Please. Tab 25. Tab 25, my, my lady, yes, please. Yeah. Or, what do we call this one? Volker or Ludwig? L Ludwig. I'm, Ludwig. I'm calling it Ludwig. Okay. It's Mr. Ludwig. It's Mr. Ludwig. Um, we can see the facts beginning at paragraph 6, please. The applicant in the main proceedings is by profession a self-employed financial advisor and acts on behalf of the EBAG on the basis of a commercial agency agreement. Through the intermediary of its sub agents, agent acting in the capacity of financial advisor, the EVAG makes available to private persons a range of financial products such as credit facilities, in respect of which the general conditions have been defined in advance with the lending financial institution. To that end, the financial advisors canvass potential clients in the name of DVAG in order to invite them to an interview, the purpose of which is to review their financial situation determine their possible investment needs. Following an analysis of the financial situation, conducted with the assistance of a computer provided by DBAG, the financial advisor proposes to that person those financial products appropriate to his needs. If the person indicates that he is in favor of credit, the advisor prepares a, a firm contractual offer, which is sent after signing by the client to DBAG, DBAG check it, and then they send it on to the lender. And at paragraph 10, you can see the lender is free to accept or reject it. And if a contract is concluded, DBAG is rewarded by the lender, and then DBAG pay the financial advisor, in its capacity of sub-agent, a commission. So you've got here, a lender, DVAG, Mr. Ludwig, who is an agent of DVAG and the potential customer for financial products. And Mr. Ludwig, on behalf of, as part of DVAG um, business, engages with the, the customer to see if they do acquire financial products. And if they do, prepares an offer, which is then 
then sent to DVAG, which is then sent to the lender. If a financial product is sold, there's a payment from the lender to DVAG, and then there's a payment of commission from DVAG to Mr. Ludwig. And the issue in the case is the taxation of that payment from DVAG to Mr. Ludwig. <laughs> question as to the relationship between the financial advice and the negotiation of a financial product. You can see in paragraph 20 the answer to that question. The answer to the first question should therefore be that the fact that a taxable person analyzes the financial situation of clients canvassed by him with a view to obtaining credit for them does not preclude the recognition of the service supplied as being a negotiation of credit which is exempt under um, D1. If in the light of the foregoing interpreted criteria the negotiation of credit offered by that taxable person forced to be considered as the principal service to which the provision of financial advice is ancillary. That's just for, for information that the question of principal and ancillary supplies doesn't arise. We can then move on to question two, please. Which is whether um, Mr. Ludwig's supply can be exempt, given that he doesn't have a relationship with the lender and is basically um, sitting in between. We'll, we'll see how they, they put it. So, there's some preliminary observations at 21. The terms used to specify the exemptions are to be interpreted strictly. 22, independent concepts of the law. There's a, an explanation of what negotiation means. And then we get to the, the real issue at 24. The National Court wishes to know first whether the concept of negotiation for the purposes of D1 presupposes a contractual link between the provider of the service of negotiation of credit and one of the parties to the credit agreement. And secondly, if there's no such contractual link, whether a direct contact is required between the service provider and both parties to the credit agreement in order to the exemption provided for in D1 to be granted. Um, that breaks down into two questions. The first is the necessity of a contractual link between the negotiator and one party. It should be noted that the transactions exempted under D1 are defined in terms of the nature of the service provided, not in terms of the person supplying or receiving the service. The provision, in fact, makes no reference to the person supplying or receiving the service. The same observation may be made as regards the nature of the relationship between the negotiator and the party to the contract, since there is no reference to that subject in the wording. And again, so carrying that line of thinking across, there's no reference in our medical exemptions to the recipient of the service and who they must be. At, at, at base, in this case, Mr. Ludwig provided negotiation services to a variety of people, including the client who was on the other side of the desk from him, for whom he was seeking to procure some sort of credit facility. And if the client then said, if I'm saying yes to you, Mr. Ludwig, you then go to your, you go back to DVAG, who goes on to the credit provider to provide the financial service to me, the client. Yes. But you're still providing a negotiation service to me, a negotiation between potentially three parties. Yes, but the point raised is that I, Mr. Ludwig, do that as a sub-agent of DVAG. And I understood. Have no contractual you have no contract with me. With either no. you, the potential customer, or you, the potential lender. Um, and so my supply of services is not to the person I'm actually negotiating with. My supply of services is to my principal, DVAG. And so the question is, well, does the fact that I'm supplying services not to somebody who actually might want a financial product, but to DVAG who themselves... In a contractual sense. Yes. In a, in a non-contractual function sense, I, as the client, yes. am getting some benefit because you're on the other side of the table exactly. and you may offer me a, exactly. a service. And that, that's the very point, is, that, is that, that even though I don't have a direct contractual relationship with you, as a matter of 
and as a matter of fact, I am providing you with offering, providing a negotiation service, and therefore exemption can apply. And we say that but the exemption applies between you and DVAG. Yes, because the service I'm providing is because that's where the money comes. And so the fact that the fact that so it's it, it, sort of the, the equivalent in this case would be would be main player the doctor. The doctor is supplying. The doctor is actually in direct contact with the patient. But the doctor is not actually making a supply to the patient. The doctor acts on behalf of main pay, and main pay supplies through a number of contracts to the to the NHS. And so the point is, you, the, the question of whether the scope of the service exempted negotiation is to be determined by reference to what was actually done, not by reference to the contractual flow. And we'll see that in a moment. They specifically say. Um, that the organizational structure cannot be in you know, effect exemption. Twenty-nine. We see the answer to that question. It follows from the above. Well, sorry, maybe twenty-seven. The court's case law makes clear that in order to be regarded as exempt transactions for the purpose of D, the services provided must do broadly form a distinct whole, fulfilling in effect the specific and essential functions of the service negotiation. And then. It, 29, it follows from the above that the recognition and activity of negotiation, which is exempt for the purposes of D1, cannot necessarily depend on the existence of a contractual link between the provider of negotiation service and one of the parties to the credit agreement. And then at 34, under the heading on the necessity of direct contact between the negotiator and both parties. It should be emphasized that the wording of D1 does not, in principle, preclude the activity of negotiation from being broken down into separate services, which may then fall under the concept of negotiation of credit for the purpose of that provision and benefit from, benefit from the exemption. In those circumstances, it follows from the principle of fiscal neutrality that operators must be able to choose the form of organization which from the strictly commercial point of view best suits them without running the risk of having their operations excluded from the exemption provided for in Article 13D1. So it's another clear statement that the organizational structure by which you get to the end result shouldn't matter for exemption. So if my learned friend is saying, well, as a backup case, a doctor going directly would be exempt, but because you've got intermediaries and therefore extra contracts in the chain, that box exemption, we would say that is directly contrary to what the Court of Justice said here, contrary to the thrust of what's said in Canterbury on Article 13, relevant medical case. But there, are, there aren't any intermediaries in this case, are there? In I mean, isn't the question is you have to ask yourself every time what, what's the intermediary doing? What's what's their service? And some, you know, maybe so you have some of those cases like the laboratory cases where the intermediary is plainly engaged in medical services itself because it's doing intermediary services. So you, again, you come back to sort of begging the question about what main pay is doing here. And I think you say, well, it can't be doing anything more than its employees are doing yes. when they get into the hospital. Yes, because that, that yes, I mean, I've issue. said it many that's times. Issue. Look at it from the perspective of. What, the, what does the customer want? The customer wants someone to come and treat and diagnose their patient. Yes, I understand. And so you look at it from the point of view of the hospital. You say for the hospital, it doesn't, or for the patient, it doesn't matter who's treating them, whether it's a hospital employed doctor or a, one, a, a contracting from main pay doctor. Yeah. They're all doctors. They're all wearing lab coats. They all know their business. But um, I, I, I suppose it's only just stating points we've already covered. But it may be said that's not the acid test. The acid test is just to look at all the facts circumstances and the commercial realities. And you keep coming back to this question about what, what is main pay doing? But then, then my, my lady, I, I submit you, you could end up in a situation where two people are providing something that is exactly the same supplier from the point of view of the end recipient, mm. that you're ending up concluding, well, that one is medical care, exempt medical care, and the other is not. Mm. 
and that would be contrary to the principle of fiscal neutrality. That's a very dramatic proposition. That's to say that all you do is you look at the end, the end of all these chains, and you say, is this, at the end of the day, medical care, and or is this a medical service being provided to a, a patient? And if it is, I must look all the way back through all the chains and say, I can't have any sticking VAT. So even people who are providing photocopy services along the way might end up no. being characterised as medical care. No, because the photocopy <coughs> wouldn't, wouldn't actually be medical care. So, but that's, so, again, that's the point. Well, no, but, but the, the point is, 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 is here, what is being done on behalf of main pay by its employees is the provision of medical services. If what was being done on behalf of the main bank was photocopying, that in some way assisted a hospital to, mm. to provide, then in its own right, photocopying doesn't have a therapeutic aim, and therefore would not be. I think that was said in X. I think there was a paragraph in X which said that you have to look at, you, you've got to look at the service, and it's only that part of it which is properly categorised as medical, which is exempt. You may have to do some sort of an apportionment. I think that was X. If you, yes, if you if you provide more than one type of service, then yes, it's only the medical care element of it that is exempt. But, but, and, but when you come back to this case, I mean, it, it is, my learned friend says this, he, he, um, this skeleton argument at paragraph 53, from the perspective of the typical or average consumer patient, it would make no difference whether their care was being provided by a self-employed locum or a doctor engaged or employed by the appellant, as they would see themselves receiving medical care from the hospital. But that's, I mean, that really is the, the point that at the end of the day what is on offer from main pay is exactly what's on offer from the, the self-employed doctor it's the same thing do you say i haven't quite tracked this point down do you say that the consultants provide their services as employees to main pay and that main pay provides the consultant services to a and e and that a and e provides the consultant services to the hospital so that every time a doctor is advising a patient you go through that <coughs> Or do you say that um, the doctor facing the patient just provides services to the patient as the patient is the patient at the hospital? In practical terms, what, what is happening is the doctor is providing services to the patient. In contractual <coughs> terms, as my lady said, there's a, a supply on set first to A and E, then to the hospital. But all the medical service of the doctor, because what what does the NHS want? It wants doctors to, to diagnose and treat its patients. What does A and E want? It wants doctors to treat and diagnose the patients of, of, of the NHS because it's got a contract that requires it to provide doctors, and then main pay provides the doctors. So, in, in, in practical terms, what happens is direct to the patient. In contractual terms, my lady's right. It goes through the, the chains. The, the point, the, the force of these cases, in my submission, is that the chain shouldn't matter. Because and the chain in Ludwig, as we saw, was that was that, that Mr. Ludwig was a, an a, a sub agent of of the um, another intermediary. He didn't have a contract with either the lender or the or the end user. But what was the court focusing on? It was focusing on what he actually did for the end consumer. It didn't focus on the contractual route by which he got there. We go back to the beginning of the chain that my lady put to you, which is. When the doctor is treating the patient, are they providing services to main pay? The, the doctor treating the patient, are they providing services to main pay? Not if they're an employee of main pay, no. And, and they are employees. Well, yes. the, the evidence wasn't entirely clear, but certainly for some of the period, they, they are employees of, of main pay. So, so what are they doing when they? What is their relationship with with main pay? What's the relationship of an employee that that does work? Well, for VAT purposes, you disregard. There's no. There's no. You disregard what the employee does. It doesn't. Um, can't give rise to a supply. So the, the doctors are employees of main pay. Main pay therefore has the. Main pay then contracts with A and E. It contracts with NHS Trust. The NHS want, wants a doctor to come and provide diagnosis and treatment to its patients. And main pay supplies that doctor. But, but on your analysis. It's main pay providing the clinical service in the con in the consulting room in the surgery on the ward because it's main. If if corporate links are irrelevant, then the person providing the service, the taxable purpose, is not the doctor. It's main pay 
So it must be main pay providing the service in the ward. I know we're, we're sort of abstracting this Where's into sort of structures, but that isn't that logical on your analysis? Maybe I'm not. It must be. Well, yes, I mean, on my analysis, main pay is providing the medical services of its doctors, correct? Yeah. Um, that, that must be what it's providing. That's what it's, being, that's what it's being paid for, because that's what everyone in the chain wants. Yeah. Uh, and then the fact that, that it's provided through a chain doesn't matter, because you look at ultimately what is done, and what is done, what is actually provided. Is those medical services and contractually, I suppose one goes one step further. It's main pay providing the medical service to the NHS with whom it has a contract. And the, under that contract, it is to provide main pay is to provide medical services to the patient. So, the main pay doesn't have a contract directly with NHS. It, it, is it only with A&E? Main pay contracts with A&E. A&E contracts with the NHS. The NHS. Um, provides medical care to the patient and, and I'm taking you through the medical cases that say well the, the fact that you're upstream of the ultimate service provider doesn't affect medical exemption and what, what we're looking at now is the, is the focus on what is actually done in this case right. what Mr. Ludwig is actually doing is providing negotiation as between you the potential customer and you the lender don't worry about the fact that he hasn't got a contract with the IBU so, so, so whether via a and D or direct, it's still main pay providing the medical service in the ward. Providing the medical service of its doctors, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you, suppose a patient wanted to accuse a doctor of negligence, yeah. would main pay be vicariously liable for the negligence of one of the doctors working in an NHS trust? I, I wouldn't like to answer that question, I'm not, I'm not sufficiently au fait with the, the law on vicarious liability to answer that. But isn't it rather important? We understand that main pay doesn't have indemnity insurance for its its employees. So if they're sued, generally it's the NHS trust that is sued. Yes. In tort, I suppose the doctor could be sued, but if the doctor was simply an employee of the company, wouldn't you sue the company? If they're providing the service. Um, you might do. I mean, as I said, I'm not sufficiently on with the law on vicarious liability to, to answer that. In terms of the relevance of insurance, um, yes, we have that finding of the fact that the tribunal wasn't satisfied that we did have insurance. Fine. Is there an answer to that? I mean, there must be an answer. You either do or you don't. I can't give evidence. My own. We, we, we strongly say we do, but the tribunal says, well, we don't. I don't have the evidence before me, so I'm, you're, you're bound on this appeal by, by that finding. But I, I simply say it's irrelevant. How, how could it? How could the difference between? How, how could the difference between whether what this is? being medical care or not depends on whether we happen to have insurance or not. It's just, at the end of the day, you're getting the same thing. And my other friend says in relation to but this... It, it, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it, it does... I mean, the patient may not know the difference, and the patient may sue the NHS Trust, and typically they yeah. do. But if, in fact, what the NHS Trust says, well, this isn't my doctor, it's main pay's doctor, so I'm going to subrogate, I'm going to have a back-to-back -back claim against you, main pay, because you sent me a doctor who's been negligent. And that would be a perfectly ordinary... Sort of litigation set up. There must be an answer to, to that. If the NHS trusts have themselves assumed responsibility for everything the main pay doctors do, then that is quite significant, isn't it, in terms of the commercial reality of what's going on? Well, the NHS trust does, in all these cases, have responsibility for patients. Mm. No one doubts that they're the one, the ultimate service provider in, in, in the terms of value to people. And so the patient may well sue the NHS first and foremost. If the NHS Trust sues MainPay, then whether they can do that or not hasn't, doesn't depend on whether MainPay has insurance. They're entitled to yeah, sue. Get, get the insurance, this is a contractual point. They, they surely would be able to, on your analysis. The NHS Trust could sue MainPay for and the, That might doctor. depend on the law of vicarious liability. They might have to sue A&E, mm. who would then sue MainPay. Who would then bring in MainPay. Who would then sue the doctor, and the doctors would have the same insurance as a self-employed locum doctor. So ultimately, you get to the same end result that... that, that Insofar as these doctors require insurance to, what, to do what they do, that, then you get to the same end result. But in terms of being able to sue, yes, I assume a &E could be sued. And we may be able to be sued. Well, we, we could be sued either by A&E or by possibly under the principles of vicarious liability. Um, but this, this highlights the difference between, if you like, a substance and form argument. You're, you're, 
argument, and you may be justified on the European case law, is, is highly structural. I'm not criticising you for being that way. I'm using the term very loosely. But even if you apply the two conditions which come out of the case law, out of Kugler 27 and Peters, medical services must be involved and they must be supplied by persons who possess professional qualifications. You're absolutely right. No one's disputing that the clinician provides services which would fall within that. But there may be a broader factual question, which is I think what we're trying to get our heads around, as to who is it that's providing the medical service? Is it just the employee? Or do we have to look more broadly than that? And if you're right, it's just the employee, then and that answers everything, then there's probably not much doubt about this case. If it's a broader question, it becomes more complicated. I mean, if you did, if, if let's test the hypothesis, let's assume that they didn't have professional indemnity insurance. I know there's a dispute, but let's just assume that for the sake of argument. That might rather indicate that MainPay doesn't consider that it is, in fact, providing medical services because it wouldn't need to, because it wouldn't need professional indemnity insurance. The fundamental principle of VAT law that it depends on objective factors, not subjective factors. The fact that I think I'm not, if they had that thought, they'd say, we think we're not supplying medical care, therefore we won't have insurance in case something goes wrong. I, I understand that, but it's, that, you say that's subjective. Maybe I've expressed the point incorrectly. That might be one part of a matrix of fact which provides an answer. But, but, uh, but again, I mean, I, I do emphasise the need to look at what is actually supplied and the way you do that. And we know this because of the principle of fiscal neutrality, which is always assessed from the point of view of the typical customer. And therefore, what's important when you're characterising a supply is what is offered, what will be received by the customer. And if you're providing, what you're providing is the same as, for example, the doctor that goes direct, on the point of view of the typical customer, then it must be treated in the same way. And if, from the perspective of the typical customer, that could be a &E, that could be the NHS, it doesn't matter. What is being offered are the medical services of property. And I, 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 as the customer, should not have to pay a different VAT rate based on whether I procure the medical services of the doctor directly from the doctor, or from main pay, or from A&E who have procured it from main pay. Because that would be contrary to the principle of fiscal neutrality, because in each case, what I'm getting is the same. And I appreciate my learner friend says, well, you're just a payroll company. You're clearly not a medical services company. But that doesn't have any interaction with what is actually being provided. What does the customer want, and what do they get? They get the same thing, a doctor who provides his medical service, or her medical service. And when you have that, we've been through six cases in my submission now that make it clear that, that you cannot treat it differently. And the court goes to great lengths to achieve that result. You've seen that in Canterbury. You've seen it in Coop. You've seen it now in the Ludwig case. The, the, the organizational structure, even if you can pick holes and say, well, Mr. Ludwig, you're not actually providing negotiation services. What you're really doing is, is providing agency services to, to the, the, the other intermediary. The court says, no, and all you need to look at is what you're actually doing, Mr. Ludwig. And you're doing that. Um, you're providing that service to the consumer and, uh, well, and, and trying to bring them in contact with the lender. And that is negotiation. And we're not fussed. We don't, we don't care about the organizational structure because that, that's a, a separate and irrelevant matter. I mean, just reading 35 of Ludwig again, in those circumstances, it follows from the principle of fiscal neutrality that operators must be able to choose the form of organization which, from the strictly commercial point of view, best suits them without running the risk of having their operations excluded from exemption. <coughs> so a doctor must be free to choose to provide their services through main pay without incurring the risk that they thereby lose exemption. It, it really would be surprising if the doctor said, well, if I go directly to the NHS, I don't have to charge VAT because then I'm providing medical care. But if I use the, if I go through main pay, because main pay obviously does provide benefits to the doctor, um, then then I, I, I'm, we will lose exemption. Not, you can't compete then because what, what, what the, the, the ordinary consumer is going to say, well, that costs 20% more than that. I'll go with that. Yes. No, I mean, fiscal neutrality in some of the cases is, is really identified almost as combination of non-discrimination and competition. So from the point of view that it's almost 20% more expensive 
and, and the services are comparable, then there's no fiscal neutrality. Can, can I just? Can, I'm just trying to identify in the judgment in the sense where the where the crux, where the fault lines between you are, and the, paragraphs 104 and 124 perhaps encapsulate where you you really criticise the the upper tribunal because there's an acceptance in 124 uh, citing Kugler uh, and it not being dependent on legal form. Thus a limited company supplying medical care through medically qualified staff fell within the company. So there's an implicit acceptance that a company does supply medical care through its staff. Yes. But then you have in 104 um, in the latter half uh, nonetheless, it could still be said of main pay that it did not play any part in the treatment given. Well, the two may be said to be inconsistent. Yeah, cool, just right. But this is really, I think, this is, this is what it ultimately boils down to: the fact that you say that it's the services plainly once the clinician provides the services. No one's disputing that that's the provision of a medical service. The question is whether main pay did so. Yes. And, and we would say, well, the reason that person is there doing that is because they have a contract with us, and we've agreed to. Uh, we, un we, yes. absolutely, we understand all that. That's yep. the essence of the. De that really is what the, the field boils down to. If you're right that in providing a service through its agents, its employees, it is providing the service within the meaning of the exemption. Yes, and that must be right because that's what Kugler says. It says, look. But, but that's that's it for you, isn't right. it? If you're if you're right on that, then. You, you, then there may be, I suppose, a question as to the complexity of the structure through which all these indirect provisions take place. Yeah. But your, your starting point is that the tribunal simply got that bit wrong or inconsistent yes. in its logic. Yes, uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I do, I've been addressing my, my learned friends, I think, slightly broader point that, well, if you're facilitating the supply of medical care by another, you're not yourself supplying medical care. So. But that's the same point, just put another way, isn't it? Um, facilitating through another whether through an agency, well, whether through your own company, whether the yes, agency of your it employees. depends how you look at it, because in Peter's, he's clearly facilitating the supply of laboratory services by that particular company onwards to the right. doctors. Um, but, but nevertheless, the court said his services to the company were exempt. And understood, I understand, I understand, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, can I just ask you, you, you said there were obviously advantages to the doctors in using name pay. I, I've not understood and I didn't see any clear explanation in the tribunals, what the advantages to the doctors are of supplying their services through main pay rather than just as a local thing? Um, well, the, the main pay, well, my little friend said it's a, it's a, provides, he is runs a payroll service, so when a doctor provides their service through main pay, they're treated as an employee of main pay, and main pay takes care of the AYE because it's an employee, which then takes some of the burden off the doctor in terms of their own tax income. And then similarly, if your doctor decided to use a, um, a personal service company, then they'd be doing that because there are advantages to that doctor, possibly in taking um, dividends as well as salary or something like that. But there are many reasons, commercial reasons, why you might choose a particular organizational structure. Um, but they don't change what the service actually is at the end of the day. It's just different way of providing the same service because um, you're not you're not considering here a supply of services from main pay to the doctor that's not what this case is about you're considering the supply of main pay and as I've shown you several times um, you're free to choose the organizational structure that suits you best from a commercial perspective without thereby risking losing exemption does your case come down to this that if you as main pay are making available doctors to provide services, then you're providing the medical care. Um, I'm not sure I'd say my case comes down to that. That's, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that description, but my description would be that main pay is providing the medical services to the doctor. Yeah, but the word of the doctor is just simply main pay providing the service, brackets, via its employees, end brackets. That's another way of... of I think that's my Lord's point, isn't it? It boils down to it's main pay providing the medical service, and on the wording, you say, of the exemption, that's it. 
because the two conditions in Kogar are, you say, relatively low thresholds. We're not saying that's wrong. We're just trying to trying to uh, frame the issue in well, its narrowest form. Uh, you know, I'm trying to understand whether there was quite a lot of stuff in the, in the lower tribunals and in your initial skeleton about how much autonomy the clinicians have in making clinical decisions. None of that seems to feature now in the argument. Is that is that now all irrelevant? Um, well, that, that was directed to this issue of supply of staff. My argument was um, in order to have a supply, in order to have in order to have a supply of staff, something must be supplied. What is that something? It's control of the essence of the service, which we didn't supply. It wasn't, yeah. we, it was retained by the doctor, who was our employee. Um, but that was in the context of this question of what is a supply of staff, which no longer features. The Prime Minister then says it's not part of the legislation. It's not in the cases. It shouldn't be read either. Just quickly finish off Ludwig, please. Um, 30, 37, please. It is not therefore inconsistent with D1 for the service and negotiation of credit to be divided, as in the case before the referring court, into two services. First, provided by the main agency, the AG, in the context of negotiation with the lenders. And the second, by its sub agent, Mr. Ludwig capacity as a financial advisor. Finally, 38, as stated in CSC Financial Services, negotiation is an act of mediation which may consist, among other things, of pointing out to one party of the contract suitable opportunities for the conclusion of such a contract, the purpose of such an activity being to do all that is necessary in order to bring parties together. The concept of negotiation does not therefore necessarily presuppose that the negotiator, as sub-agent, as the main agent, enters into a direct contact with both parties. If I may just briefly run through this to make sure we've covered all the principles, I don't suggest I've less than a um, So paragraphs one to three are, I submit, are very clearly borne out by the cases we've read. Principle four, again, we've seen it numerous times, but importantly, in my submission, I take my, my latest point about what the other tribunal is actually saying, but that is different to the way it's worded in the other tribunal decision. Paragraph 5, we have seen that. We saw that in LUP. Six is a point we've been focusing on a lot. We've seen that in three cases. Um, seven, we've seen it in the cases of my other friend, I think, has confirmed to me that he's not taking a point on where the services are provided. And equally, um, at eight, there's no requirement for it to be supplied within a particular framework of a confidential relationship, which is otherwise would be inconsistent with the extension. Nine, that's a fairly standard description I, I would respectfully submit. And ten, we've seen in LUP and F. And then eleven is, is a paragraph I drew attention to in LUP, consultation. Consisting of explaining and diagnoses and potential therapies are likely to have a therapeutic purpose. And that's what we say is happening here. Um, Twelve, the requirement relating to qualification is to ensure that the exemption only applies only to medical care that is of sufficient quality. That's in Solovell, but we did see it when we went through the cases. I can't remember exactly where, but it's by reference to Solovell. Googler, exemption is not dependent on the legal form, or we've clearly seen that. We've also seen that the reasons support that conclusion include the purpose of the exemption and fiscal neutrality. And it follows from those that whilst only natural persons may possess the qualification referred to in C, a company can fall in C in respect of medical services that are provided by suitably qualified workers. And that is the necessary conclusion from Kugler. Then we come on to activities upstream. And we saw in LUP, activities carried out upstream from those provided by the ultimate service provider can be exempt. And therefore, it's not the case that only medical services provided by persons in a direct relationship with patients come in the scope of the exemption, which sort of touches back on the points we've been discussing more recently. 
Accordingly, medical services are provided by one person to another in order to facilitate the provision of medical care by the latter, which may fall into <coughs> exemption from medical care. And that, my submission, is the necessary result of LUP, given that we have the chains of supply there. And then the Peters case, equally where services are provided to a laboratory company by an individual who is a medical specialist, amounts paid for those services are exempt, amounts to Peters. And then we've got the two points I've just taken you to in Ludwig and Canterbury. So I, I think I have made, at least tried to make good each of those propositions um, in, my, in my short note. But I thought it'd be easier to do that rather than to try and keep tabs of all the different propositions we're seeing over and over again. No, thank you. That's helpful. Fairly, fairly short now because I'm, I'm coming to my supplemental skeleton, having dealt with probably most of what I need to say. Um, but it, it breaks down into to three parts. The third part is part C, which is on the location of the medical care. But I understand that's not a point taken, so the tribunal, sorry, the court need not concern itself with part C. And as I understand it, part A is, is the nub of the issue now. Attempted to, to summarize, well, the HMRC get this proposition from the other tribunal um, because after the hearing they sent around a note asking for further submissions, essentially on the location of care point. But in amongst that, they said things about the doctors not acting independently, facilitating the care, provision of care by the NHS. And it seems to be that from where my learner friend gets this, this, this point about well, if you're facilitating the provision of care by someone else, you don't, or you're, you yourself are not providing care. Um, I mean, my initial observation on that is, is he gets it from a comments by the upper tribunal, but can't point to any court of justice case saying anything like that in relation to exemption from medical care. Which is the, quite the, the upper tribunal did not analyse this case on the basis of the analysis you've just advanced to us. So, and, and you, you therefore say on the basis of that analysis and your note that they've applied the wrong test in law. Yes, I mean, my, my first ground of appeal is set out initially in terms of, well, there's only two conditions, medical yeah. care and, and qualification. And the upper tribunal didn't say which of those is not met, and we said they're both met. Um, so that... But then then takes us into this question about who's providing that service, and really the, what I they badly called the, the company law issue, the structural issue. The structural issue, yes. And, I mean, they... they and as, I've, you know, I've been, as you've been talking, I've been just trying to flip backwards and forwards to see where those issues arise in the judgment. But they, we, they arose mostly, I would say, in relation to the question of um, fiscal neutrality. That's right, in paragraph 124, but it also came up, as I mentioned earlier, yeah. I think in 104, so under it, ground 1, 2, and 3. Yes. But it, it's not the, the cornerstone of their analysis. No. The cornerstone of their analysis is a continuation of the... Um, yeah. Issue as before the FTT. Well, it's it's it, it's whether it, it's whether the it's the framework analysis or the direct clinical judgment yeah. analysis. Yeah. That's the two competing contentions which they address themselves to in the judgment. Yes. Yes. And my submission was that framework control is not something that you need to apply; it's just something that exists. Whereas control is something. Control of what you're actually doing is something that you can supply. But, but that that's. That was the way it was put before the FTT and the other tribunal. But as, as I've said in this court, it was framed differently. Yeah. Um, I mean, in one sense, those those are your submissions, aren't they? That they've just applied the wrong test. They yes. didn't apply the two-part test in any deliberate way. Yes. The way in which they've framed the test between sort of framework or direct clinical judgment is not the way the court has applied it in the European Court cases. Correct. You say the European Court cases track into the EU retained version. There's no difference. So, we, so yeah, those so guide. This is a pre pre Brexit case. Anyway, absolutely, so absolutely. Yes. And then, right. I mean, one sense it may be the. I don't know if there's a lot more you want to say. It may be we, we, we listen to HMRC that your your case is in a sense in, not not a criticism, but there's shifting grounds here, perhaps on all sides. I mean, our job is to get the answer right, not necessarily to, to, to hold, to 
the analysis below. Yes, I mean, my lord, they're, they're really, in going through the cases and having the discussions with, with, with the bench, I, I've been able to make, I think, all the submissions I would want to, to make. I mean, you have my written version of these arguments. It starts at paragraph 15, where I refer to the ordinary meaning of purpose and the CGOEU authorities. But I'll be doing no more than probably repeating what yeah. we've already covered. Um, well, you'll have an opportunity to deal with yes. HMRC submissions in reply. Yes. I'm just wondering what the most efficient way to deal with it. I'm not trying to shut you down at all. If no. there are things you wish to to submit, then feel free. But the alternative is to listen to HMRC and you, you have a right of reply on the matters. I mean, partly because things are shifting. Yes. Maybe maybe there's one point I can deal with and then I'll sit down, my lord, which is the Clinicum case. Because I think that's the only case that my little friend relies on from the CJU to, to say this supports his analysis about um, having to act independently and with res my respectful submission that that's a misinterpretation of the case. So if I can deal with that case and I'll, I'll, I'll finish and I should be able to hopefully get that done before lunch so that I can pick up. Um, there was one other CJU case which they placed some reliance on which was not a medical case, but an education case. Yes. The um, Horizon College. Yes. Uh, are you going to deal with that in reply, or do you want oh, to anticipate it? I can anticipate it. I mean, the Don't worry about <coughs> that. I mean, I mean, you, you do whichever way you want to. But, but, but um, The simple answer is that, that case is very specifically about the meaning of education, and the requirement for a framework. Um, was the court's understanding of what education meant in, in the context of the directive. So the s simple conferring of knowledge, although we might colloquially refer to that as teaching and skilling, wasn't within the meaning of education in the directive, which required this framework that you only got in an educational establishment. But we don't have anything like that. We have no suggestion of a requirement for a framework in relation to medical exemption. What you have, in fact, seen is the rejection of the requirement for a framework of a confidential relationship with the patient. And you see nothing equivalent in terms of not only must you be actually diagnosing and treating them, but you must be doing so in some particular framework. That's not what C is about. Um, and in fact, it's interesting in relation to the education exemptions, you've got uh, an exemption for education, you've got a separate education for private tuition, suggesting that there, there are different concepts going on there. And that lends some support for this idea that education requires an, an overall structure rather than just the conferring of knowledge. But I'll, I'll deal with it in reply, but that's my short answer on horizon. Thank you. Um, the Clinicum, it's behind tab 32, please. AG, That's the AG, but we need the court. Yeah, um, paragraph 18. Um, KD is a non profit making limited liability company which manages a hospital. During 2005 and 6, it had accreditation to provide out care. Doctors employed by KD provided the outpatient care within the hospital worked under an individual authorization grant. During 5 and 6, the hospital patients suffering from cancer who were treated with chemotherapy. The cytostatics that were administered to those patients were prepared individually for them on the basis of medical prescription within the hospital pharmacy. Where the cytostatics were used for inpatient hospital and medical care, on the hospital premises, it's not contested their supply was exempt. That was exempt. During those same years, KD was of the opinion that the use of cytostatics prepared in its hospital pharmacy was also exempt from VAT, where outpatient care was provided by doctors working in an independent capacity in a hospital managed by them. In contrast, the health authorities took the view that dispensing of drugs for consideration in the course of outpatient care for patients was subject to VAT. So just, just to, to understand, if we can, what, what, what is being... Um, the supply that this case concerned is the supply of drugs, the cytostatic drugs. I'm not actually concerned with the supply of the doctors. And if you, you remember
remember back to B and C in the directive. B is for supplies of medical care by hospitals, essentially, but it also includes closely related supplies, whereas C doesn't refer to closely related supplies. When the hospital is, is the person who's providing the care to the end patient, then it was accepted that those supplies were closely related, the supplies of cytostatic drugs. The question being raised here is where we have doctors who are operating independently of the hospital, and they prescribe a, a regime of cytostatic drugs to the cancer patient, and then the hospital supplies those drugs to the patient, is that supply of those drugs to the patient exempt? And, and, and the, reason, the reason this issue arises is, as I said, because B refers to closely related supplies, but C does not. And we'll see that in a moment. So at 23, by its third question, which should be considered first, the Victorian Court asks in essence whether C must be interpreted as meaning the supply of goods such as the cytostatics in issue in the mains proceedings prescribed in the course of outpatient treatment by doctors acting in an independent, independent capacity within a hospital may be exempt from VAT as an activity closely linked to the provision of medical care. 25. In that regard, it is apparent from the file before the court and the information provided by the parties during the hearing that the care provided by the doctors in question in the main proceedings acting independently of the hospital but within it is itself exempt under C. So what that's saying is that when these doctors in the hospital supply medical care to a patient, the exemption that applies to that care supplied by the doctor to the patient is C, not B. And at 32, however, contrary to the wording of B, the wording of C does not contain any reference to activities closely linked to the provision of medical care, despite the fact that that provision immediately follows B. It must therefore be concluded that in principle, that article does not refer to activities closely linked to the provision of medical care, and that that concept is not relevant to the interpretation of C. They then go on to talk about slight qualification in the sense that drugs or goods that are supplied in, in the immediate course of the doctor um, consultation can be exempt under C if they're integral to that particular consultation, but we needn't concern ourselves with that. The key point is that these cytostatic drugs were prescribed and then supplied independently by the hospital, and what the court is saying is that the exemption that applies to you, as the doctor, when you supply your services to the patient, the cancer patient, is under C. It can't be under B, under C. And because it's under C, and C doesn't refer to closely related supplies, unlike B, you cannot, there cannot be exemption for that closely, even if it would be closely related, which it probably is, that closely related supply of drugs by the hospital to the patient. And the, the point of explaining this to, you, to the court is simply to illustrate that it has nothing to do with this case. Because, as I said, the ultimate taxation there is on the supply of the drugs. Ultimately, that turned on whether you were within B or C. The court said you're within C because you're in the hospital acting independently. And then they said, but and you cannot read in the words closely related because they're, they're specifically mentioned in B, and it would be wrong to read them into C, given that whoever wrote this clearly decided not to. And therefore, that supply of drugs to the patient is not, is not um, an exempt. It tells you nothing about the taxation of supplies prior to the ultimate service provider. Nothing. And so in my respectful submission, yes, it refers to doctors acting independently, it doesn't tell you anything about the relevance of that doctor to this applies um, the exemption for medical care in this case. Um, one minute uh, um, past the bench, but that was what I wanted to say on Finnegan, and unless I can be of further assistance, I'll, I'll conclude my opening submission there. Thank you very much.
very much indeed, Mr. Bill. Um, so, Mr. Singer, it'll be over to you at two o'clock. If there's something burning which you've forgotten, you'll have 30 seconds at two o'clock. Uh, otherwise, it's your show. Thank you very much. Two o'clock.